Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris. I'm an alcoholic. It's good to be here tonight. It's good to be uh, the the filler in between uh, uh, Peter M's uh, 12-step uh, presentation. I'm uh, I'm certainly enjoying uh, what he's bringing to the group here. It was uh, it was really a, a good thing that we were able to grab him, and he was uh, able to come down here and, and share his experience with us. I was thinking about what you know. What do I want to talk about tonight? Because I don't want to. Um, I don't. I kind of don't want to interfere with the flow of his, um, uh, what he's trying to do, um, and I thought, I thought what would be the most important thing I could talk about, and uh, I, I was thinking about um, having a balanced program, having a balanced uh, 12-step recovery experience. Um, I, I do a lot of uh, speaking for. Uh, for uh, rehabs, uh, treatment facilities. I, I, I speak sometimes for uh, colleges, um, uh, Rucker School of Alcohol Studies. Uh, Fairleigh Dick, Dickinson has a program where, they're, where they, uh, uh, they graduate mas- uh, master's degree uh, social workers, and uh, they have alcoholism classes, which every once in a while I get to come in, and I'm the show and tell for the, uh, the alcohol classes. Um, but I've, I've, I've kept busy in, uh, in the treatment facilities environment. And I've kept busy in Alcoholics Anonymous going to uh, beginners meetings and going to meetings where you're going to find people coming in and having a first experience. Um, and one of the things that I see, unfortunately, one of the things that I see is it's very difficult. It's very difficult to get an understanding of what you need to do to recover from alcoholism in a treatment center. It's, it's hard to find out what you need to do in beginner's meetings. Uh, it's almost hit or miss these days uh, in AA uh, to go to a place where they're actually going to tell you uh, the, exactly what you need to do uh, to be able to recover uh, from alcoholism. And I, I don't know why that is. Uh, I can tell you a little bit of my uh, my early experience. In, in 19, uh, 1984-85, uh, I had to I had to sign myself into an outpatient to get my license back for a, a multiple DWI. You know how they they make you do those fun things, the IDRC people. So uh, I wasn't I wasn't anywhere near ready to give up drinking. I'd only lost a family, my driver's license three times, eleven jobs. Uh, uh, you know, all my friends, uh, it wasn't bad yet. So, uh, I was going to continue to drink for, for another six years. Uh, but I did get, I did get exposed to, uh, to an outpatient, uh, program. There was eight sessions I had to go to. Uh, the first session I went sober because I didn't know what to expect. Uh, the, se- the second through eighth session I went drunk because, uh, there was a three-hour period of time between the end of work and going to outpatient. And what do you do if you've got some time to kill? You go to the bar, and that's uh, that's what I did. So, so uh, I, I'm not really I'm not really going to say that I absorbed a lot uh, from this. Uh, I did learn a little bit. Uh, number one thing I learned is I hate Father Martin's guts. <laughs> you know what I mean? If I saw one more chalk talk, I would show him where that chalk goes. Let me tell you, because I just was, I, I mean, today, <laughs> today, uh, I have a complete different uh, attitude and outlook on what he does. I think he's probably one of the preeminent uh, family recovery uh, individuals on the planet. But while I'm drinking alcohol and having him lecture at me with, uh, at the chalkboard, I was not too keen on that. Thank you. Uh, so I would I would uh, critique Father Martin at the end of the movies. I'd raise my hand and I'd explain to the to the poor uh, counselor uh, who was stuck with me. Uh, just what I thought of uh, of Father Martin and what he was what he was trying and how he couldn't possibly understand me. 
You know, this is the this is the flag that all alcoholics wave in the early days. And it's you, you know, you just don't understand. My case is different. You know, that's what that's what we all I'm not like you. I've got real problems. So anyway, uh, I get through this and uh, they don't do anything really in this outpatient except try to hand me tools, try to hand me uh I remember getting a thing on relapse prevention, you know, the, the 36 warning signs of relapse prevention that, and, and, and a whole bunch of other really helpful things that, that uh, uh, didn't work at all for me. Uh, I went on and continued to drink until I got to a point where I, I, I really felt like I was losing my mind and, and I was willing to do whatever I needed to do to, to get sober. Um, my last drunk consisted of me threatening the lives of my entire family over Christmas vacation while we were all home at mom's. Um, and I was going to kill all of them in this drunken blackout. And uh, that wasn't the festive type of uh, uh, experience they were all looking for. And uh, they ended up taking their Christmas elsewhere. Thank you. And I remember coming to with a, a, a pile of vodka bottles. I don't even remember buying. I, I was at, completely out of my mind. I was hallucinating. I was in, in the DTs. And uh, I went uh, I went back to AA. Uh, I had had I had had inpatient now and I had had outpatient treatment at this uh, at this uh, facility. And I don't like to, to name facilities uh, because of one reason or another, but it was CAI in Morristown. <laughs> and I, anyway, I, and I used to say, I used to say things like, you know, in my or my first year or two, I used to say, oh, CAI was a really good place. It was a really good place. It was really, it sucked. Okay, it sucked. It didn't it didn't hand me half of the tools I needed to be able to stay sober. Uh, it basically gave me a thirteen thousand dollar big book. And a pat on the butt to AA. And everything else they tried to teach me in there was all, all stuff that I would need to rely on human power. It was all things I would have to rely on human power. You know, get somebody's phone number. Here's the, you know, get a counselor, go to outpatient, you know, do this, do that. It was all human power. And I'm telling you, I work with a lot of treatment facilities. And what I try to do is I try to get in there. And I try to carry a message of a balanced program so that so that there may be an opportunity that somebody might be listening in that rehab and might hear me talk about what what really has to happen if you're really in trouble with alcoholism. Now, not everybody is really in trouble with alcoholism. There's a lot of people who still have some control over the amount of alcohol that they drink. I think we all we all we all meet them uh, uh, here and there. Do you remember any of the people that you used to drink with who drank just as bad as you did? But the time and the place came and they gave up alcohol for good. You know, they they, they met a, they met a little lady or they got a job or they got out of college and, and or, or whatever. And, and they calmed down and we didn't. You know, we kept going. Our progression kept moving. Well, there are people out there that look just like an alcoholic. They drink just like an alcoholic. They crash the cars. They end up in the hospitals, and they're not alcoholic, okay? They have power over alcohol. But there's what they describe in the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, a real alcoholic. That's an individual that cannot quit cannot stop, cannot moderate on their own unaided will. It is impossible for them to do so. The, they may stay sober for short periods of time, maybe even moderate periods of time, but the time and the place comes and alcohol goes back in their body. And if you're, if you're into drugs and you're here tonight, the time and the place comes and, and you, you pick drugs back up because you're, you do not have a sufficient defense against that first drink. That has to come from a power greater than yourself. And if you're not being exposed to a power greater than yourself, uh, if you're not working to uh, you're not working on that relationship with a power greater than yourself, you're rolling the dice. And uh, the time and the place, uh, if you're a real alcoholic, the time and the place is going to come and you're going to put alcohol back in your body. And it may be the last thing you want to do. You know, uh, my, my last relapse was one. This is this. This is what happened. I, I signed myself into a rehab. 
Sign myself in. I, I was not pushed in by a boss. I didn't have cops shoving me in there. I, I really wanted to separate from alcohol. So uh, I took a month off of work, went into this rehab, and really tried to pay attention. And uh, during outpatient, my second outpatient from this place, um, uh, after I was, I was paying like $40 a night for outpatient, I just paid $13,000 for 30 days in, I was going to two AA meetings and I wanted to stay away from alcohol as much as and there was not a person in the room that wanted to stay away from alcohol more than me. The thought crossed my mind that it would be a good idea to buy a gallon of vodka and drink it. And that's exactly what I did. Uh, it, I mean, it, absolute insanity. Knowing what happens to me when alcohol goes in my body, for me ever to, to take a drink, I have to be completely insane. And that's what it was. I didn't have a sufficient defense against that first drink. Um, they talk about in the second step, uh, come to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. If you, uh, if you follow the, uh, the word origin of sanity, uh, it, you would think it would lead back into the psychological field. Uh, back into the psychiatric field, but the but the root uh, the root origin uh, goes back to 16th century English law. What was happening was uh, they were they had laws, uh, and if you broke them, they'd put they'd put you in uh, in prison or in the stockade or you know whatever. And there there was a problem. There was a bunch of there was a bunch of nuts who were going around and doing things that they really didn't have much control over, and they were putting them in prison just like they would put somebody in who you know did it out of uh, you know malice or, or, uh, or you know for evil motives, and and they they can't, they just decided that it was wrong to punish these people who who were mentally incapable of really understanding what they were doing. So they came up with uh, they came up with an insanity defense and an insanity defense basically what you have to do to prove an insanity defense is you have to prove that you're not responsible that you didn't know right from wrong you could not understand it sufficiently and uh, when it says that we need to be restored back to sanity that's what it's telling us we are not responsible if we lack the power of choice in drink, how can we be responsible when we get drunk? That's part of the insanity of alcoholism. Now, uh, once you learn a little bit about what the solution is, you can't use that as a cop out anymore. You can't say, well, you know, I, I, I have no power. I have no power at all. You have the power to place yourself in the spiritual atmosphere, spiritual climate where uh, that obsession of the mind can be removed. And that's really what Alcoholics Anonymous is about. Um, on this piece of paper, in, in the last 10 years or so of big books, you don't see this circle and triangle. But the circle and the triangle used to be on the title page of the book Alcoholics Anonymous. It's an ancient spiritual symbol that we kind of adopted and uh, um, uh, it's it's a three legacies of uh, three legacies of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a legacy of unity, and that's the meetings and everything that revolves around the meetings. There's a legacy of recovery, and that's the twelve steps as they're, as they're laid out in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And then there's a legacy of service, and that's all about either carrying the, the alcoholic to the message or carrying the message to the alcoholic, whatever you're capable of at that period of time. And that's what, that's what Alcoholics Anonymous was about. That's how it was designed. That's how it works best. When I first came into AA in this area, it was all about meeting attendance. Meeting makers make it. Everything, everything was all about how many meetings are you going to. It was, it was a, it was a, it was a fellowship that was promoting meeting dependence. Like, oh, you drank? Well, did you miss a meeting this week? Is that, you know, yeah, I missed Thursday. Oh, there you go. You know, you missed Thursday. You got drunk. I mean, so really, around this area in 1989 and 1990, 
And I'm not saying that there was, you know, there, nobody was trying to hurt anybody. They just didn't know better at this period of time. There was really very little, uh, very little uh, emphasis on literature based recovery. So what they were saying was just go to a meeting, no matter what, just go to a meeting. You know, you just shot your, your wife, go to a meeting. You know, uh, you know, you just robbed a bank. Well, you know, you'll be a better bank robber sober, you know, so go to a meeting. And, and this is, re- this is really uh, what was going on. Now, uh, I happen to, uh, I happen to be a real alcoholic. And s- staying sober, attempting to stay sober, and going to a, a ton of meetings is not the treatment for alcoholism. It's not the treatment for alcoholism. It is a way to bring about uh, an atmosphere of recovery for a short period of time while you figure out how to recover from alcoholism, but it's not a treatment for alcoholism. At best, uh, you can stay sober for periods of time. Anybody in here stayed sober for periods of time, going to a lot of meetings, and then uh, then not, then it fell apart. <laughs> you know, we get we get them all here. You know, we get them all here. That's the, they they end up in Bernersville. But uh, but anyway, uh, so. I just knew that, 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 that becoming meeting dependent was not going to be my answer. Yeah, I'm willing to. I'll go to, you know, I was going to 14 meetings a week. I, I, I'll do that. I'll do that. But there has to be some kind of answer because I'm dying inside. Inside, emotionally, I'm in turmoil. I, you know, I'm afraid all the time. I've got resentments. I've got guilt and remorse. I'm restless. I'm irritable. I'm discontented. I never feel I'm not comfortable with myself or my environment. And you ask me, hey, Chris, how you doing? Fine. I'm doing fine. And, you know, if I was really to be truthful with you, I'd say something like, well, I'm contemplating suicide, but I can't get life insurance. Uh, you know, my, you know, my life and, and, and I can't commit suicide until I get life insurance because, you know, I, I got a daughter. So I'm stuck. You know, I, well, how are you? You know, I mean, <laughs> that's that's how I that's how I would have to have to answer you. Truly, if I said truthfully, you know, but, so I said the, the the newcomer mantra, how you doing? Great. Fine. And meanwhile, I'm dying inside. I want to kill everybody. I'm judging everybody in the meeting. Uh, there, there's that mutton head with his hand up again. He's going to share that same crap. Good God, I can't believe I put a dollar in the basket. You know, I mean, and uh, and and I'm just I'm just dying. You know, I'm dying. And I get a hold of a couple of tapes from a couple of a uh, couple of guys from Arkansas. Now, I had a problem with that because I hate people from Arkansas. You know, I mean, never knew any, but Arkansasians, you know, I, I just don't particularly care for them. I don't like Oklahomians either. You know, and if you're for tech from Texas, that's even worse. You know, so I'm going to listen to these guys on these tapes from Arkansas. So I start listening to, to these tapes and they started talking about having a balanced program. They started talking about meetings are a great start. But to go to a lot of meetings, make a lot of coffee, be the secretary in your group, you know, drive people from treatment facilities to the, that's not a program. And that's the first time I heard that because uh, I was told in my group that you, you worked a good program if you went to a lot of meetings. And that was just, that was just erroneous information. Uh, you don't work a program by going to meetings. You work a program by working through the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, that's not my opinion. That's that's what the book Alcoholics Anonymous says, unfortunately. So so here I was just finding out after I had about a year sober, I was going to a billion meetings. Uh, I was doing everything you could possibly do in AA. I was going to the diner. You know, I was, I was lending money to people that weren't going to pay me back. I, you know, I, I was I was uh, I was dating newcomer women, you know, because I'd probably be able to stay sober better that way. And I found out that that's, you know, not the best idea. Anyway, uh. Anyway, uh, I go through these tapes and, and I learn that, that there's, there's something else. And I'm upset about it because I don't want to be told I have no program. I don't want to be told that I, I, I'm really doing it wrong here. So what I, what I do is I put the tapes away. But the truth will haunt you. There's this great line uh, in, in, uh, in the chapter, Working With Others, it says, If we have disturbed you about your alcoholism, that is all to the good. And I believe that that's true. I believe that the truth will first piss you off in a big way and you'll you'll try not to have to deal with it. But uh, but you will need to come to terms with it, especially if you're an alcoholic. 
you are going to need to come to terms with your alcoholism or you're going to you're going to you're going to you're going to at, at best maintain a very untenable sobriety being not the nicest person in the world. Uh, at worst, uh, go through a series of relapses that are going to end in, uh, you know, you know how, how we, we check out when it's when it's finally time for us to check out. We don't do it with a lot of dignity. So uh, so anyway, I'm listening to these tapes. I, I decide I'm going to pull them back out and I'm going to listen to them and I'm going to open a big book and I'm going to see what this is all about. There wasn't anybody in my groups that were, do, were, were doing the big book in my day. There were people around. I used to say there wasn't anybody around that was doing big book work. There, there were. They just weren't in my group. Uh, so, uh, so I started, uh, I started going through the, the book and, and, and taking the exercises. Where it said to do something, I would stop and I would actually try to do it. And I didn't do a very good job, but I, I did a, a good enough job that something really started to change in me. You know, when I, when I, uh, it got to the point where I was actually out, I actually went to my sponsor with a four column inventory and he said, what the hell's all those columns? Where's your story? And I'm like, well, you know, don't worry about it. Let me just read this. Uh, it's just the way I'm trying it this time. And, and uh, I got to, I got to amends and I actually started going out and making amends, like to old bosses. I, I never heard any of this stuff in ninth step meetings at that, at that period of time. All I heard in ninth step meetings was, yeah, I said, I'm sorry to my family, you know, but they're still treating me like I'm a jerk, you know, type of stuff in ninth step meetings. So, so anyway, uh, I, I start, uh, I start doing this and I'm sponsoring some people at this period of time. So, uh, uh, so some of them are drinking on me. You know, you ever have a sponsee drink on you, make you look bad? <laughs> It's even worse when they borrow money or something from people and then drink. You know, it really makes you look bad. So these guys, a couple of these guys were making me look bad. I got them over to my house and, and I said, look, let's open up this book and let's let's do this. I'll, I'll do this with you. And we started on the title page and we started going through. And whenever there was instructions, we sat down. And, you know, we, uh, we we put these people down on paper in black and white. You know, that's what we would do. Before, and then we would move on. And a funny thing happened. Uh, a few of these people moved away and thought thought better of uh, having me for a sponsor and went went back to the guy who just wants them to have the cookie commitment or something, you know, instead of make amends. So some people disappeared from me and went with the cookie guy. Uh, but for the people that stayed, uh, the people that stayed with me uh, and did the work, uh, they actually had spiritual awakenings. They're all still in AA. They're all still sponsoring people like you wouldn't even believe. And their quality of life is uh, is off the charts. So I learned that not only did this work for me, it worked for anybody that uh, that put it into practice. Um, after that, it was a much different. It was uh, prior to going through the steps. All I could do was encourage you not to drink. I could say, "Hey, come with me. Let's go to a meeting. You know, get in the car. We'll go to a meeting. Or, or don't drink. Or here, give me a call if you feel squirrely." I could only encourage people to not drink. After I went through the steps, I could now offer them, offer them uh, 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 the tools to have a spiritual awakening and recover from alcoholism. Not, not slowly recovering. Uh, a lot of people that say I'm a slowly recovering alcoholic aren't. Recovering, you know what I mean? Uh, it says in our book, Recovered. I like the way Peter puts it when he's up here. Um, recovered. Um, again, I like to qualify that because every once in a while someone will come up to me after the meeting, which happened not long ago, and started taking me to task, saying, you know, we don't recover. We've only, always got alcoholism. And we're not cured. We're never going to be cured of alcoholism, but yes, we can recover. And the, the basic way that, uh, that I'll define cure and recover is like this. If you're cured of an illness or a disease, the illness or the disease is removed. If you're recovered from an illness or a disease, the symptoms of the illness or, and disease are removed. The symptoms of alcoholism have been removed in my case because I've gone through the steps. I maintain consistency at meetings and I'm of service. So, uh, so my spirit is, my, my spiritual condition is being maintained a day at a time. So I'm recovered from alcoholism today. It doesn't mean I can't relapse. It means that today I'm recovered. So, um, so, uh, I, I believe in, 
I believe in what happens in Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe in what happens with the book, the text Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, uh, it took a while. Uh, it took a while for um, for me to understand some of these things because I didn't really have a sponsor who was a literature-based sponsor. You know, today it's fairly easy. You can find somebody that'll take you through the steps that that'll that's that's done it before. Uh, that really wasn't my case. So it took me a lot longer. Uh, for some of these things to happen than it would for, for, for individuals today. Um, but basically, uh, basically, if you're in real trouble uh, with alcoholism, the treatment for it is consistent meeting attendance, get a sponsor with experience with the steps and go through the steps, and then, main, and then maintain and grow uh, your spiritual condition with the disciplines of 10, 11, and 12, and then find a way to be of service because once you've had a spiritual awakening, you can you can uh, you can carry that to other people. Uh, step step twelve says, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, and I read that for years before I really understood it. I would hear people share, I had my spiritual awakening the other day in the bakery. You know, what are you talking about? It says having had a spiritual awakening as the result. Of these steps. You can't have a spiritual awakening as the result of steps you haven't taken. And again, um, again, it's very, very hard to understand something prior to an experience. A lot of people will take me to task, depending on the, well, the meeting I'm at, if I say something like that, uh, because they, they've never done the steps and they think they've had a spiritual awakening. And again, they're, have, they're, they're basing they're basing uh, 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 something on opinion. If you've never done the steps, how can you know what the spiritual awakening is going to be like if you do them? You're just going to be giving me an opinion based on an experience you haven't had. If you've gone through the steps and you've had a spiritual awakening, I can talk to you about that. Because then we'll be sharing experience with each other instead of me sharing my experience and you sharing your opinion. So, um, so again, the most difficult thing, I think, uh, facing a sponsor or facing people that are carrying a message into a treatment facility or anything like that is to convince people not only that they're powerless over alcohol, powerless being powerless, but that there's a, there's a recovery solution. And to give them at least at least the, the basics of what that recovery solution is. You know, uh, one of the things that Bill Wilson used to say all the time was he said the good can sometimes be the enemy of the best. If you meet somebody, you meet a newcomer, and you give them you you, you give them uh, your phone number, and you say, "Give me a call. I'll be happy to help." That's good. But if you offer that newcomer an opportunity to get with you and start working a program, start working the steps, you know, I'll, you know, let me tell you which meetings to go to. I'll, you know, these are the ones I go to. If you want to work with me, you know, I'll help you with a program. That's the best. And the good can sometimes be the enemy of the best. And if you're handing somebody a phone number and hoping that they're going to pick up that 2,000 pound telephone and call you, and stumble their way into a program or something, that's not as, that's not as good as if, if we actually uh, reach out our hand. There's been so much disinformation over the years that has is, that is, that is infiltrated AA. So much of it comes from well-meaning friends on the outside that don't understand the kind of damage that they do. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, some of the things that have come from treatment centers. One of them was uh, 90 meetings in 90 days. Now, it's not bad to do 90 meetings in 90 days. It's bad to think that that's what the treatment is going to be for your alcoholism. It's not a 90-day treatment for alcoholism. It's a lifetime treatment for alcoholism. So to tell somebody to go to 90 meetings in 90 days is good. But it's the enemy of getting somebody involved in consistent meeting attendance Encouraging him into the steps and helping him find something to be of service with. You know, there, there's so many ways to be of service. There's so many ways to give back that you know, each one of us could do it a different way. Uh, you know, I do it differently than uh, than other people. One of, one of my really good friends is the 
is the uh, uh, committee for uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, Public Relations Committee or something for for AA. And he goes all over the place uh, and does does workshops for GSRs and and uh, and DCMs and all that, all those type of things. Um, that's one way to do it. Another way is is to uh, to volunteer your time at treatment facilities. You know, you, you, work, sponsoring people is a way to do it. Uh, workshops, uh, service work, coffee commitments. There's a million there's a million different ways to get it, to get involved in service. But it's important to uh, it's important to get a balanced uh, a balanced product. Alcoholism is a devastating illness. This this uh, this disease this illness kills so many people. The the survival statistics. If you're an alcoholic, your survival statistics are about about 10 percent or 15 percent of the alcoholics today are going to going to survive it. Uh, 85 to 90 percent of uh, alcoholics are going to die drinking. Now, so that tells you right there, it, it's it's not a good it's not a good disease to have. It's not a good illness to be diagnosed with. So uh, so we really can't play games. It's an unorthodox illness. It's an unorthodox illness, and it's an unorthodox treatment method. Any other illness on the face of the earth that's not another obsessive compulsive illness, you go to a doctor. The doctor will prescribe pills for you, or or radiation, or you know. You'll get some. You'll get something from the doctor that's going to enable you to heal. Alcoholism. You have to undergo the treatment yourself. You have to undergo the treatment yourself. And trying to convince somebody of that sometimes is very difficult. It's the hardest job a sponsor will have. It's the hardest job you'll have going into a treatment center. Trying to explain powerlessness to somebody that doesn't understand it. So many people that I meet up with in these places are, well, you know, this time, this time I, I understand how serious it is this time. You know, this, this time, oh, believe me, oh, trust me when I tell you, when I go home, I'm, I'm not drinking again. Oh, my God, you wouldn't believe what happened to me last time. I'm not drinking again. And ten minutes later, they're drunk as a goat, knee walking down the road, you know, looking for another bottle. I mean, what happened? Well, this time, this time, I really mean it. You know, I mean... You're, you know, do you understand powerlessness? Pa- Think about powerlessness for a second. Powerless means this. If there's anything you can do to keep yourself sober, you're not powerless over alcohol, and you can't admit to being an alcoholic, and you can't even take the first step. That's the truth of it. That's the truth of it. So, how do you, how do you get through to a sponsee? Here's what, here's what happens to me all the time. I'll be talking to somebody. I'll go over the whole first step. I'll say, look, you have an obsession of the mind. That means that your mind is going to convince you to pick up alcohol again against your will at any time it chooses to. Do you understand? Yeah. And once you start drinking, you're not going to have any control over the amount you take. You you, you could end up in Topeka with one shoe. You understand that? Yeah. Okay, there's a solution. There's a solution, and it's going to require a commitment on your part. Are you willing to make a commitment? Yeah. Okay, I want to see you at the meeting tomorrow night. Right? Uh, get get there 15 minutes early so we can talk. Oh, <laughs> Friends is on tomorrow night. I never miss Friends. What what don't you understand about what I just told you? What do you, what? Here's the big thing. The biggest problem with people is a lack of enthusiasm to participate in their own recovery. There's a lack of enthusiasm. And they, they, they just don't buy in to the, they don't want to commit, uh, yeah, you know, I'll go to your meetings, you know, I'll, I'll let you do your brainwashing routine, but, but I, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know about some of this stuff. I, I mean, it's the hardest thing that we can do. What usually helps, unfortunately, is a series of progressively uncomfortable bottoms. You know, one, one more nightmare debacle after another will sometimes soften an individual up to the point where they'll, they'll start to listen. But if you're that type of a person, if you've sincerely tried to stay away from alcohol and you've found that time after time you've picked it back up and you don't even really truly understand why, I mean... You, you, you just you think you've cha- you changed your mind, but really changing your mind is is the dumbest possible thing you could have done. 
If that's the case, you, you know, you may be the type of alcoholic that needs a little bit more than somebody that wants you to become meeting dependent. You know what I'm saying? You're going to be the, you're going to be the type of person who's actually going to need a recovery program. You're actually going to have to do the fourth and fifth step. You're actually going to have to go out and make amends. You're going to have to go back to Mrs. McGillicuddy and return the lawnmower that you stole when you're when you were 10 years old. You're going to have to do all those things that you don't think you need to do. You may have to because it may be the difference between dying an alcoholic death and and actually taking those steps. Uh <sighs> I don't know why I was given the, the, the perception, given the ability to see this early on so that, so that I actually could participate in my own recovery. Uh, but I know that as I moved into step 12, I, I knew what I needed to do was carry the message to other people. I knew that that was, that was a responsibility I was going to have to have. And I was going to have to do it for a long time, I'm sure. Now... Um, Another thing that another thing that kills there's a lot of killing killing things that go on in Alcoholics Anonymous in, in this day and age, still in this day and age. One thing that kills people is this. There are there are people in Alcoholics Anonymous who are not powerless, not completely powerless over alcohol, or they're not down the scale. They're not down the scale that far. And they waited four or five years to do a four step. Uh you know, they, they never really had service commitments much. And uh, the prayer and the meditation is not something they bother with. They've got their two or three meetings that they go to uh, like it's the Rotary Club and they're cool with that, you know. And their life has, has gotten better because, because they're, you know, they're basically heavy drinkers who, who stopped drinking. Their, their life got better. Uh, somebody goes up to them and asks uh, a, a guy who somebody who's in real trouble goes up to one of those people and says, will you sponsor me? And they'll say, sure, I'd be glad to help. Uh, and what, what they'll do is, is they'll give it away the way they got it. Uh, if they if it took them four years to do a four step, they'll think that that's appropriate in your case. And you'll end up drunk and maybe dead. So. Um, if, if you're the type of person who, if it was your experience to wait a long period of time to do these steps, and if it was your experience that you didn't really need to get involved in service commitments, and if it was your experience that you didn't have to go to meetings consistently, that's fine. There's no, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no good or bad about that. But please understand that that may not be somebody else's experience. They may really, really have gone down the scale. They may need a spiritual experience fast. Fast. They may, they may need to start moving through the steps right away. They may need to, to, uh, to do the fifth step and to, to do amends in the first couple of months. And, uh, that, you know, how can you tell? How can you tell how quick somebody needs to do the steps? Unfortunately, you watch how fast they relapse. You know, that's sometimes how you can tell. Uh, I've I've worked with people who it was appropriate to hold off a while on the four step. Now, you know, I don't do the cookie cutter sponsor sponsoring kind of style. It's appropriate sometimes to allow people a little bit of time, maybe to get off some medications or, or whatever and and hold and just get them get them in the group, get them really involved in, in, in the meetings. And then when, when they can handle it, start moving them into the steps. But I've also sponsored people who had to be on the fourth step the day they got sober. They had to be on the fourth step the day they got sober or they weren't going to have a sober tomorrow. And that's my that's been my experience uh, sponsoring. Uh, again, everyone's everyone's a little bit different. Everyone's going down the scale uh, probably to a different to a different point. But one of the things I, I did want to talk about here tonight was uh, was a balanced uh, a balanced AA life. Um, it's an equilateral triangle. Equilateral meaning each of the sides are the same size. So look at it this way. Ask yourself this question. And again, it's no right or wrong. It's just either are you or aren't you. Uh, do you do you participate equally in the fellowship? the recovery program, and service. I'll give you a for instance. Let's say you go to four meetings a week. Uh, add all that up. It's about six or seven hours worth of time. 
Do you spend six or seven hours worth of time every week on the steps? Prayer, meditation, uh, 10 step, inventory. Uh, 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 do you? You know, it's an equilateral tri- triangle. You're supposed to. In the early days, they didn't pack their whole program filled with meetings. They didn't even have any meetings. All they had was program and service. OK, do you spend six hours on service commitments, you know, working with other people, going going to institutions, whatever your service commitments are? It's just a question, because I don't think I've ever seen anyone with a good balance in the three legacies ever drink again. I just never have. Uh, you could if there's somebody in this room who uh, who was consistent in all three sides of the triangle for for a, a long period of time, never, never wavering, never getting inconsistent, and you drank, you know, come up and tell me. But it, I've never had anybody do that yet. Uh, they always fell short in one, one part of the program. They always fell short in one side of the triangle. They always backed away from, uh, from the, the steps, you know, prayer, meditation. They, they, did, they didn't sponsor. They didn't do service work. Or else, you know, the big one stopped going to meetings, got drunk. Even heavy drinkers get drunk when they stop going to meetings. You don't even have to be alcoholic to get drunk when you stop going to meetings. A lot of times you stop going to meetings before you stop going to meetings. And that's because you're not participating in meetings. You're not involved in the steps. You're not involved in service. And there's not enough power holding you to the meeting. You don't want to hear what, you don't want to hear one more mutton head talk about what their week was like. You know what I mean? Please tell somebody who cares. You ever been to those meetings where you just want to hang yourself when you leave? You know, I mean, how how long can you take that if you're not really working a program? Because I'll, I'll tell you what, I've been able to take it for 14 and a half years. And it's because I do a lot of step work. You know what I'm saying? If I wasn't doing my steps, if I wasn't doing service and I had to listen to, 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 to one more mutton head talk about talk about how, you know, how ungrateful their family is and how. How, how over demanding their boss is and, you know, how about the, the tennis pro got uppity with them that day or something. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't still be going to AA, you know, the the the, the Mercedes fan belt resentment, you know. But my, my all time favorite is the spot on the X-ray meeting. You ever go to a spot on the X-ray meeting? Good God. I'm, I'm bad, aren't I? You know, let's talk about alcoholism. Uh, you know, the spot on the x-ray won't kill you as quick as the booze will. I'll tell you that. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> I've probably ranted enough. <clears throat> I want to give uh, give equal time to opposing viewpoints here tonight. <laughs> so uh, I'll turn uh, I'll turn it over to Dave. Dave, you you take it. Oh, thank you. There you go. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.